All right, great. Well, um, good evening or good morning, I should say, everyone. Um, I know, exactly. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, so my name is Killian Clark. Um, I think those of you online can't see me, but you can hear me. Um, I'm an assistant professor uh, here in the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, um, and I'm really pleased today to um, introduce today's speaker um, and event. Um, so Dr. Ahmed Abrabo is joining us uh, this morning. He's going to be giving a talk entitled The Military and the Egyptian State. Um, and this event is obviously being sponsored in part by uh, the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies here at the School of Foreign Service, but also by the Middle East Studies Association's uh, Global Academy. I mean, it's, it's the inaugural event that we're going to be holding in a series uh, uh, highlighting the work of the Global Academy scholars. Um, and so a special thank you to Mimi Kirk, who's joining us on, online, for helping to make this possible. Um, so uh, Dr. Abrabo is uh, currently a visiting assistant professor in the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. Um, his work is really uh, wide ranging. Uh, he works on topics of civil military relations, political Islam, democratization. Um, he also uh, is, is, is doing research that focuses on two different regions of the world. So both the Middle East uh, with a focus particularly on Egypt and Turkey, but also East Asia. Um, today's talk is gonna be more focused on the Middle East, but um, Ahmed is bringing together really interesting comparative work from different regions. Um, and so he's gonna give a presentation today about his research um, uh, that's gonna be about 35, 40 minutes, um, and then we'll open it up to discussion. I'll ask a few questions and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, both from those here in the room and, and for those of you joining us on Zoom. Um, for those of you online, uh, so our, our protocol here is if you wanna ask uh, Dr. Abrobo a question, uh, put your question in the Zoom Q&A and then our events manager, Coco, will, um, uh, will, will, will voice those questions here in the room. Um, so I think that's everything. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Galen, and, and uh, thanks for the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies and for uh, MESA, Global Academy, and Mimi, uh, definitely for giving me this opportunity and for having me here. Um, <clears throat> let me start by a very interesting, funny kind of story. Uh, I've been struggling to change my title officially with the University of Denver for, for the last couple of years as I'm no longer visiting. I know it's not mi your mistake because it's written there, still written there, but anyway, so <laughs> I'm no longer visiting. So I, I, I just it turned into a permanent position, uh, but here I am. So, um, so let me start uh, first by a <laughs> disclaimer. And my disclaimer is uh, I'm going to speak about the changes uh, in the civil military relations in Egypt over the past uh, 10 years already, uh, since 2013. Uh, and, and my disclaimer is it's, it's going to be somehow a pessimistic uh, analysis and uh, uh, or let's call it emotionless talk. Uh, and I'm saying emotionless because I guess uh, usually when Egyptians speak about, you know, the Arab Spring, uh, Arab uprisings, uh, post-2013 politics. Some of them, including myself, sometimes we get emotional. And getting emotional sometimes makes you, as a self-defense, I guess, you, it makes you, like, optimistic. And you try to give maybe some unrealistic analysis. So I'm just, I do my best to uh, reflect on my research on the civil military relations and offer hopefully uh, much more what I call or what I claim uh, realistic analysis um, uh, was, was hopefully with no emotions. Um, so uh, when you speak about civil military relations in Egypt, uh, many people ask what's new, if there is anything new, so you can have a talk on, on civil military relations. If, if there are any recent developments, the military seems uh, you know, uh, untouchable. The, the civilians or politicians in Egypt, you know, they, they have been already marginalized. Uh, do you see any hope? Uh, and actually, my talk today is not going to give any kind of like new analytical framework. However, I'll try to give some insights about the most recent developments in the civil military relations. I will also try to uh, maybe give much more attention to the future, some futuristic scenarios, uh, especially based on the most recent deal between the IMF and Egypt. I mean, the deal, of course, was signed back in, in 2016, but like I'm going to speak much more about the uh, last two reports came up out of the World Bank and IMF, and for the first time ever, mentioning 
uh, uh, the Egyptian business and the Egyptian economy, uh, which to my knowledge never happened before, and to what extent we can see any uh, changes based on, uh, on these developments. Um, just as a background, um, uh, you know, Egypt has been always governed by uh, the military since um, at least January 1953, or let's say July 1952. And the military dominance in Egypt has been institutionalized in many ways, starting from President Nasser, who uh, uh, more or less directly or indirectly ousted Najib, the first president of Egypt, simply because they have many disagreements. And one of these disagreements uh, uh, was about the rule of the military. And it ended up with President Najib, the first president of Egypt, you know, spending the, the rest of his life uh, in under house arrest. And um, uh, President Nasser was trying to offer a social contract, which I guess was very successful in a way because his main idea was the military and the Egyptian armed forces uh, uh, is going or are going to be the main agent for development. And uh, we will offer you, the people, we will offer you better education, better health. Uh, we will level you up and we will improve your, you know, uh, living standards. And also we offer you a regional project where Egypt is going to be or is the main leader, the Arab nationalist project. And in return, you give us, you know, uh, uh, absolute uh, reality. Um, I guess that was very successful, at least from 1954 till 1967. And there was this transitional period between 1967, 1970. And uh, with the death of Nasser, we started to see uh, a real change in civil military relations. Now, when we speak of changes in civil military relations from one period to another, that doesn't mean by any uh, standards that we are talking about improvements or positive changes. Uh, when I speak of changes in civil military relations in Egypt, I, uh, I don't really refer to any kind of improvements on uh, democracy or democratization, but like the balance of power and uh, uh, the component of the political equation has changed a lot during President Sadat, who was trying somehow to civilize uh, the the political uh, uh, the political arena, and uh, at least since 1975, he started uh, a very ambitious economic plan called Infidah or openness uh, economic openness. He was moving away from the Soviet Union into uh, uh, into United States, and in 1976, he started. Um, a very another very political ambitious plan by opening what we call the platforms or manaber, uh, um, trying to not to democratize but at least to, trying to offer uh, much more rooms for civilians. Uh, of course, Nasser was not. I'm sorry, Sadat was not doing that uh, in particular to to change or improve civil military relations. I guess his main idea was to get rid of his. Uh, 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 rivals, uh, those who are, uh, I mean, military and security uh, personnel uh, uh, who are affiliated with, with President Nasser. However, the very big dilemma came in 1977 when President Sadat made a visit to Jerusalem, when all of a sudden Egypt started to move into a real peace process, even if we call it cold, but still a real peace process with Israel. And, and uh, I guess this has impacted a lot the civil military equations in Egypt in two different ways. Uh, first of all, the military was no longer in power, was no longer in at the heart of the political stage. And there was a real problem here because uh, military doctrine during Nasser and you know early years of Sadat has been always that Israel is the enemy. So now having peace with Israel the question is, how can we change this? How can we change the enemy? Or how can we change our doctrine? Uh, this question was not answered, was never answered by Sadat as he uh, was assassinated in 1981. Uh, but before I speak about who, who answers this question, let me also explain the second uh, uh, outcome of the peace process with Israel, which was somehow Islamizing the civilian space in Egypt. 
uh, by allowing more uh, uh, um, political activism, actually political and social activism uh, by different uh, Islamic by different Islamic groups, hoping to balance uh, um, between you know moving into this peace with Israel and satisfying uh, the the uh, the Egyptian community or the Egyptian general public. Now back to the question how to change a, a, a military doctrine. It's not an easy process. It, it does take years. And, um, and, you know, you can read like conflicting analysis. Some people said that ever since Egypt signed a peace deal with Israel, you know, now the military started to, to push into much more of like business and, and get away from politics and the political doctrine kind of changed based on my research and, and many interviews I had, this is not true. Uh, at least that doctrine part is not true. So the doctrine kept like at least among the body of the military, maybe if we exclude the very senior uh, uh, military positions, uh, uh, middle ranking officers, low ranking officers, most of them kept thinking that Israel is the enemy, but they have been also witnessing how the Egyptian state is no longer leading the Arab world or you know Arab nationalist project. And the second part is true. Uh, it's very true that uh, one maneuver to get sure that the military is no longer involved in politics during Mubarak time was, of course, to open them, you know, uh, spaces for political, uh, I'm sorry, for economic uh, uh, projects, economic uh, 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 business. Uh, uh, and But that was done during Mubarak in a very invisible way. And also during Mubarak, you can speak of civil security, relations instead of just civil military relations. And because again, the military started to be invisible, focusing much more on uh, economic affairs. The military withdrew from most of senior political positions. Of course, this is not to suggest that, you know, all senior positions uh, were taken by civilians, but at least many positions were taken from, from uh, military personnel and given to uh, civilian people. And of course, what helped Mubarak to civilize the, the civil military equations or to civilize the political equation, let's say, is of course the National Democratic Party. Uh, it's the truth that the National Democratic Party was established during uh, President uh, Sadat, but like, you know, it went very, uh, 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 it became a very strong political actor in Egypt by the end of 1980s, early 1990s, and it became the main political arm of Mubarak especially to control the domestic political arena. And uh, after uh, Mubarak was able to get rid of one of his main rivals, uh, 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 Abu Ghazala, who was the Minister of Defense, um, he was, you know, he was able uh, to control the military by appointing uh, Colonel Tantawi and in 1991. And ever since the military has been and I'm using here the, the, uh, what uh, Yazid Sayed is using to incorporating the military uh, into the uh, economic uh, uh, arena uh, in Egypt. Now, Egypt started a privatization process in, in 19, early 1990s. And of course, the military has been always there. Uh, 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 many uh, uh, military retired uh, senior officials have been appointed as uh, directors of uh, in the executive uh, committees of many of the failing, uh, struggling public sector companies. And later on, these companies were sold to uh, the private sector. Uh, there are here like, you know, much talk about uh, behind the scene politics, corruption, etc. But it wasn't until 2011, and here is like, I'm moving into the real talk today. It wasn't until 2011 when we started to see the military as a state, not state within the state as it was usually described, but the military became the state. Uh, of course, it took the military two years to figure out how to do it. Uh, many people have different, um, different analysis and different perceptions on whether 2011 was very well orchestrated coup, uh, um, or it was just a real revolution that later on was kind of like you know, uh, utilized or capitalized or uh, exploited by the military. In my point of view, the military was not that smart back in 2011. And based on my analysis, I strongly believe that the military didn't have a concrete plan and they didn't 
really, at least according again to my analysis, I argue that they didn't really know what would happen in the next day when Mubarak left, except that they were fast learners. You know, they, they started to learn as they go. And of course, one of the very fast learners, in my point of view, during that time was uh, the current president, uh, Sisi, who was at the time uh, the head of the uh, military intelligence. And of course, he was very active during this transitional period, meeting with many uh, political activists, many meeting with many political uh, uh, actors, leaders, including Muslim Brotherhood. And in my point of view, he was smart enough to realize and to define uh, a plan to re-engineer civil military relations and to reinstitute the military, uh, the military power in politics. Uh, it, it all started with uh, claiming supra-constitutional powers as early as 2012, I'm sorry, as early as 2011. Uh, by October, November 2011, we started to have in the political discourse in Egypt what so-called supra-constitutional uh, powers that should be given to the military. Uh, in, in, the, in, in law, we call this a constituent power, like you know, that the military claims or claim that they have this power, which means technically they preside over the entire political system, including the constitution. Um, that was not possible during the Muslim Brotherhood because of course it wasn't easy to do it. For the first time, Egypt had a civilian president coming from the Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, like that came with some sort of political polarization, but it wasn't an easy task for the military to, to take power over or to uh, institute this supra constitutional powers. But of course it was very possible after 2013. Um, in 2013 on, the military started to dominate, not just the political, but political, cultural, and the economic uh, uh, scenes in an unprecedented way. Yes, it's very true that the military had some sort of like entertainment functions back in 1980s and 1990s by having hotels, or by organizing some uh, uh, arts, uh, you know, venues and, and, and affairs by having some sort of uh, uh, movie uh, theaters uh, by uh, offering uh, holes, I mean, military, military holes for uh, weddings. Uh, and, and that was very true, but I guess it was very unprecedented uh, during President Sisi when the military started to claim all aspects of the public life in Egypt, including religious aspects, including cultural aspects, and most importantly, the economic aspect. Um, now, when president, as of now, and based on, of course, there's no way you can really count uh, the real power, the real weight of the Egyptian military's economy. However, based on some uh, estimations, we have at least 34 officially registered military companies. We're not here talking just about military production. We're talking about military production. We're talking about what so-called the self-sufficient approach, which means that the military should produce uh, some food and beverages and uh, personal kit and, and, and some non-compact materials and products to you know, just rely on, on, on themselves. That was already coined back during another time, but that was also revitalized during President Sisi, but most importantly, that the military went to play the main um, active economic function in Egypt mm -hmm. since 2014. Um, there are so many manifestations of this. Uh, uh, many companies are growing uh, directly run by the military. All infrastructure, without exception, all infrastructural projects, mega projects are run by the military. And, um, and you have so many other partnerships between the military and, uh, and the business community in Egypt. And uh, th this economic empowerment of the military was never possible without political empowerment. And the political part was done by not just liquidating the Muslim brothers, but also cracking down on any possible or potential uh, political uh, uh, challenger. Uh, uh, so many other political parties were uh, marginalized. For the first time since, since Nasser, Egypt 
is no longer having a political main institution where you can speak of a kitchen where politics is, is cooked. There is nothing like that. Uh, many political parties are trying hard to convince the president that they want to replace the old National Democratic Party. The president doesn't accept, and I guess consciously or intentionally, he doesn't accept this proposal because in his mind, he doesn't want any organized uh, 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 political platform, even if this organized political platform is, is loyal to him, he doesn't want that to happen because he knows at the end of the day that there will be some bargaining, there will be some sort of negotiations, and he doesn't want to negotiate, and he doesn't want to bargain. And 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 that's why uh, the Egyptian parliament, for example, uh, put aside the fact that, you know, elections are rigged or maybe not, not very transparent, etc., but actually it's very fragmented. Uh, uh, to the extent that not a single political party is able to gain more than 15% of the seats. Most of, most of the, the majority of the, uh, of the members of the parliament are running as independents, or even if they belong to political parties, but the electoral system in Egypt held them or helped them to uh, act much more as independent uh, uh, politicians. And of course, independent here doesn't mean actually that they are independent in terms of what political agendas they, they can adopt or what legislative agendas they can adopt. It just means independent in terms of they don't have party connections or even if they have party connections, this is just for formalities. But, you know, whatever they think the president wants or wish, uh, they uh, are trying to uh, satisfy him. So politically, all political parties in Egypt have been marginalized. The military is in control of all economic uh, uh, aspects. Uh, constitutionally speaking, it wasn't until 2019 when the military, and this is very interesting because now we can move a little bit to speak about uh, the relation between the military and the president, uh, which is not very clear. And of course, like we don't have reliable data or information, but we can get some insights. In 2014, Egypt adopted a new constitution. Legally, it was called the Amendment of 2012 Constitution, but I guess practically, technically, it was a new constitution. But it wasn't until 2019 when there was a very clear, in my mind, in my point, very clear, very clear bargain between the president and the military. The president wanted to extend his time and power. So as of 2019, the original plan, 2014 constitution, he was elected in 2014 to run for maximum eight years. So it was should have been uh, terminated in 2022, but in 2019, he extended his time and power. So as of now, he can stay till 2030. And, and that win, he accepted to give up to, to give up some sort of concessions to the military. And this time, this is Article 200, which is very interesting because it reads, uh, I mean, very similarly to the uh, 1982 constitution in Turkey, when the military obviously uh, uh, saying that we are the guardian of the state. We are the guardian of the civilian nature of the state. We are the guardian of democracy and stability. So, which again, uh, for those who know Turkey or studied about Turkey, you know, that has been always used um, uh, as a justification for the military to uh, intervene in politics and actually uh, stage uh, military coups in Turkey. And, 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 and I'm saying this is very interesting because even the president, even the president right now has no right over or you know, has no upper hand over the military, should the military decide as a unified entity to move to correct or to maintain uh, democracy. Of course, I'm not suggesting that there is any internal conflict. I'm not suggesting that the military is not coherent. I'm not suggesting by any means that, you know, there is a real rivalry between the president and the military. What I'm just suggesting is uh, every now and then you can see some sort of bargain, some sort of uh, negotiations between both sides, but they are still in, in, very, in, in, in very good terms. Um, moving to the future and to what extent we can expect any real change in this relationship between the military and uh, civilians and politicians in Egypt. To what extent President Sisi can coin a new social contract uh, for example, as I said, President Nasser's social contract was, uh, I'm, I'm giving you all kind of subsidies, economic help, 
and then you're loyal to me. Now Egypt has no regional role to play. So there is no regional promise. Egypt did try during President Sisi to speak about its regional rule, how can they secure the Gulf, but that was nonsense for the Gulf countries who already passed Egypt in, in, in establishing relations with Israel, uh, which was a very important card uh, that has been always played by Sadat and Mubarak to uh, maintain the Egyptian regional power. Uh, and uh, the economic promise, uh, which was another promise Nasser did or Nasser made to Egyptians is not there. So the president can no longer deny or can no longer promise Egyptians of a good standard of living. He did many times, but like as of now, you can see um, how the economic, uh, how the economy of Egypt is, is really, I don't want even to use the term derailed because derailed means like there was some sort of line and, and derailed, but I, I guess it's much more of like it failed. All the major uh, economic uh, uh, um, major economic assumptions uh, failed. Um, there is no regional rule. And uh, the only maybe promise that President Sisi succeeded to achieve was a security promise in terms of internal security, in terms of fighting terrorism. So the question now is what can change if there are any changes to happen in the civil security uh, relations uh, or civil security equation in Asia. Uh, if we visit the literature of civil military relations, uh, there are much talk about many factors. Uh, there can be a coup on the coup, there can be some political uh, external pressures, uh, there can be uh, political mistakes that will lead the army to leave politics like Argentina, for example, when they decided to uh, invade the Falkland Islands, and then that was, you know, that came with a very high price because next year they, they had to leave power. Also, some, some literatures also talk about some rational decisions of the military to, to move back, to take a step back and maybe leave the political arena, at least officially for some civilians, even if they are considered puppets. But also like, you know, a, a, a larger volume of, of literature are, are mainly focusing on the political economy and how the political economic conditions or factors may impact civil military uh, equation in Asia. This talk came back to Egypt in 2019 when, as I, I said earlier, when the Wallet Bank came with the first ever uh, official written reference to the military as, uh, as an active partner in the economy or active actor, I'm sorry, in the, in the economy of Egypt. And when, most importantly, the IMF in 2020 revision report, uh, uh, they came not just to mention the military, but also to, to break down military activities in an official report, and then to directly say that, you know, these uh, uh, activities should be uh, unified and should be pro to, uh, to uh, much more transparent uh, scheme. And as a very immediate reaction, uh, President Sisi, of course, promised in a public speech in Egypt to uh, 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 list the shares of some military uh, uh, companies in the uh, stock market, which he didn't. And back in 2022, this last December, when the IMF signed a new deal with Egypt for 3 billion US dollars, again, the same talk just came back to uh, if, if the IMF or the Wallet Bank or some international uh, superpowers and great partners to Egypt may pressure President, Sada, uh, President Sisi to uh, uh, list uh, military uh, companies and corporations into the stock market. And the question now is if he will. Last week, he made another promise by saying again, the same he said two years ago, about his intention to sell uh, military, uh, or not to list military shares in, in the stock market. But then he mentioned something very interesting, which is he was speaking about how difficult it is. And to be honest, I guess he's genuine. It's, it's difficult for, for different reasons uh, to, to, to have the shares of, the, uh, of, of military corporations in the, in the stock market. And the 
main point here is to ask if the IMF and the World Bank are really keen to pressure the military or to pressure the president to open up military, the military economy. And if even if the IMF is keen and is willing, uh, is there any real political will? And even if there is a real political will, I'm speaking about President Sisi, if that is possible. So we're, we're having like two different factors here. Number one, do we really believe that the IMF and, and the World Bank will keep pressuring Egypt to open up the, this closed kind of, uh, uh, I mean, the, the economic uh, empire of the military? And my answer is it doesn't seem so because we've learned over many other experiences, whether in Egypt itself or outside Egypt, that the IMF is looking much more into some very short term, immediate economic financial stabilities. And uh, this is what matter first and foremost. And the idea that they can pressure is always there, but they can never pressure till the end and they can never change any real political security slash security establishment. And to my knowledge, we don't have any uh, uh, other case in history where the IMF was pressuring and, and changing the civil military equation. But the second factor is if there is a political will, uh, I guess the president, mainly inspired by generating cash money, he may want to, to list some uh, military companies in the stock market. I guess he might be genuine about that. There can be some sort of political will. But the problem is, of course, He's not doing that just to, to, to go for any kind of uh, 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 more civilized civil military equation, not for any political reforms, but if he's willing to do that, it will be just because he wants to generate money as soon as possible. In all of his political speeches, he's speaking about cash money and he's giving numbers of like how many billions of US dollars Egypt need. And you know, sometimes he says 20 a year, sometimes he say 10. So his main idea is how to generate, how to generate this cash money. The third and the last factor is, let's suppose that the, the IMF and World Bank, United States, the European Union, and even Arab Gulf countries will pressure CC to open up the military uh, uh, empire, economic empire. And let's suppose that President Sisi will have this political will to open up this file. Can anybody do that? Uh, in my point of view, I'm not, I'm not saying impossible, but it's really tough for so many reasons. We're not talking here just about you know, some corporations here and there. We're talking about a very sophisticated image where the military formally and informally is partnering with so many you know, business communities, business actors. Uh, we're talking about power relations as well because the military knows very well, away from the president, put the president aside, the military knows very well that the moment that we, they will have to, to open up this uh, economic empire and the, the moment that they will you know, have to be transparent will be the, the moment when, you know, uh, we will count down their existence and power. Um, don't forget also that we're talking about a huge, uh, uh, a, 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 legal, a legal package that was adopted by President Sisi since 2014. As of now, based on my count, we have 22 new laws from 2014 till 2000, uh, 2022, organizing, re-engineering, uh, 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 the uh, military economic affairs. Um, and, and of course, it, it's mainly done to facilitate the military control over uh, different, economic, uh, different economic activities. So if the IMF or the World Bank or the president are really serious and keen to open up this program, they will have not just to list some corporations in the stock market, they will have actually to go even beyond and change the, the, the entire legal framework that has been crafted over the last seven, eight years. Um, they will have also to rely on some uh, civilians or some oppositional groups in Egypt, which I guess right now at least are not very active, are not very um, united. I, I don't think anyone has a real plan. Uh, and of course, I'm not blaming them. Uh, you can't tell easily why. And uh, so uh, based on this, I'm, I'm going to my final part. I 
genuinely believe that for the foreseeable future, let's say the over the coming five to 10 years, I don't see any real change if we mean by the term change, if we mean the positive changes for democratization, uh, civilian control, et cetera. But what I can see is in, in one or two or three years, and due to the dire economic situation in Egypt, uh, the president will try to offer some concessions to civilians, but I doubt that these are going to be uh, or these are going to cause any real serious changes in the civil military equation. So I guess it's fair enough to say that for the coming five to 10 years, Egypt will be still governed by the military. The military will not be a state inside the state. The military will be the state. And even if President Sisi leaves for whatever reason, you can think of uh, assassination, you can think of, you know, just he dies, you can think of a coup on the coup, whatever happens to him, that will never change the civil military equation in Egypt, because again, we're talking here about a very uh, sophisticated uh, network of relations, of powers, of money uh, that goes beyond the president. And it's not just about, uh, about the president. I will uh, stop my talk at here. And uh, I guess I'll be very happy to maybe discuss more aspects um, uh, uh, during the Q&A session. Thank you. Very good, thank you so much, Ahmed. So, um, so I'll, I'll kick things off with a couple of questions to start us, start us off, and then we'll, we'll open up to um, questions uh, from folks here and also on Zoom. Um, do you want to join us at the table? Oh, yeah, uh, sure. So we can have sort of, we can, yeah. we can uh, yeah. a bit of a round, round table yeah. format. So, you know, <laughs> so sobering end to what was a, a very uh, insightful uh, talk. So thank you so much for that. Um, sometimes our, our analyses lead us to conclusions that we, uh, we aren't happy with, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to, to argue with your ultimate conclusion um, that, you know, for, at least for the medium term, it's likely that the Egyptian military is, is, is here to stay and is going to continue to, to run things, to run the show. Um, I, I, I have two questions that I'll start us off with. I guess the first speaks directly to some of your final points, um, Ahmed, about um, the economy and the state of the economy in Egypt and its relationship to political power. Um, I think that political economy is a really useful lens to use to study um, you know, civil military relations in Egypt, um, not least because the Egyptian military has such a strong control over the economy and, and so many economic sectors. Um, you focused on pressure from, from the, the IFIs, from IMF, World Bank, from international power. I'm wondering if you see, well, let me phrase it this way. What will happen if Egypt faces a real economic crisis? Because it seems like that could be on the horizon. I mean, the situation, the economy is in very bad shape. The Egyptian pound just, you know, lost, it lost a ton of value earlier last year, but then also very recently, there was another major devaluation. The um, investments that the military has been making seem to be mostly in white elephant projects that don't seem to be yielding any economic value, things like the capital, um, the expansion of the Suez Canal, um, you know, the economy seems to be in really bad shape. And while I agree with you that we don't have a lot of historical examples of, you know, major political change, democratization coming through pressure from IFIs or, you know, the IMF or the World Bank, just because as you, as you said correctly, they usually don't push that hard. There's a limit to how far they're pushed. We do have precedents of major political change coming from incidents of economic crisis, right? The Asian financial crisis of the late 90s led to political transitions in that part of the world. In Latin America, we have examples of that as well. What, what do you see happening if, if Egypt's economy really falls off a cliff, a cliff and there's a, you know, a, a, a public debt crisis or there's a, you know, a, a major crash of the pound? What, what, how will the Egyptian military handle that? And could that potentially be a catalyst for some kind of a political change? Sure. Um, you know, um, I was just thinking when, you're, uh, when you were saying, when you were uh, putting this question in, if Egypt doesn't already face a, a, an economic crisis, and of course, that can, you know, be subject to many different evaluations. Or what do we exactly mean by, by an economic crisis? In, in my point of view, based on my knowledge, 
I guess Egypt is already facing a real economic crisis. Mm -hmm. And I'm not here talking about the overall performance of the regime, the, the, the macro economic scene. I'm, I'm just talking about the ordinary people and their daily life. Mm -hmm. In my point of view, the, the, the bound already crashed. Like yeah. two months ago, the bound one US dollar stood for 15, 16, now officially 30, officially. Not to speak about the, the black market, which right. still exists, right. uh, which I guess can go up to 34, 35, which means that the bound in, in two months or three months lost 50% of its power. I call this crash. Right. I call this economic crisis with the inflation and everything. Now, the question is, can this lead to any real change? In, in my point of view, it can really lead to some sort of compromises. It can lead to some concessions here and there. But can this really lead to a different political equation where the military is totally out of power and, and the entire political arena will be, will be governed by civilians? At least for the coming five years, I don't see this happening for many reasons. One, the military will always have the power to offer the very least to keep the situation as stable as possible, even if it comes you know, in a very dire economic situation for people. Okay. Arab Gulf countries, even though there is now a very yeah. big talk about if, if Arab Gulf countries is giving up on presidency, and I cannot see that. Of course, it happens every now and then that they criticize him harshly. Yeah. Sometimes they even ignore him in many ways. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that they can strategically leave Egypt to, to fall into, you know, a, a real economic crisis yeah. to the extent that, you know, he had to leave power or the military had to leave power because they know very well what is the alternative. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, this is not even parable for, for United States and, 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 and the European Commission. Mm -hmm. They cannot really, I guess, they are not ready to go for another refugees crisis and and president Sisi is using this card in a very intelligent way uh, to scare you know partners and international uh, international alliances like you know uh, don't push too hard because if 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 it flips you will be uh, you know flooded by if if syria had 20 million 25 million and see what happened in you like this will happen yeah. like two three times so again, just back to your question, I guess we are already facing an economic crisis in, in at least based on my evaluation, my analysis, but there will be always some external factors that will help Egypt to have the minimum needed leverage or, or, or assistance to, to just keep living and to help Egyptians just to keep living uh, without, of course, any improvements in their standards of life. Yeah. So this is what I see. I see some concessions, I see some changes, uh, but I don't see any real shift in the civil military relations over the coming five years, even if we still include the economic analysis into, uh, into the equation. Yeah. Yeah, the Gulf factor is obviously yeah. something that really is different than the other. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm going to your um, overview of the situation, it raises lots of interesting questions. Of course, Egypt's leaders, including Nasser, were dealing with the IMF all the way back then after the nationalization, and it suddenly didn't look so good. The IMF was stepping in. So, you know, this and the Egyptian government's uh, military has a lot of experience fending off pressure from the IMF in all kinds of ways. It's the art of survival. So quite extraordinary under Nasser, under Sadat, under Mubarak, each in their own way. Um, but I'm wondering, when you talk about uh, pressure from the IMF, what is the goal here? Um, you know, the IMF may want all kinds of stabilization measures, but stabilization without what they call euphemistically structural adjustment doesn't really buy you very much, literally, right? Because the source of the bleeding of the economy remains. And one of those sources is the Egyptian military. So there's a huge contradiction here between the IMF sort of talking about reform and the scope of the military's, I mean, it's a huge import substituting industry. It's a drain on the economy, but it's the source of the power of the military. So what, I mean, what, what, what are we talking, what are we talking about when we, you know, you talk about listing the, some of the businesses, I mean, I mean it's either going to be some sort of effective privatization, but <clears throat> I can't see from the, excuse me, from the point of the military, how that serves their interests. So for me, the big question is really what's going on here in terms of so-called reforms 
Uh, I mean, again, the military has been very good at making concessions and have, and it's all about survival. But it, it, it and it, so this gets to Killian's question. You know, at what point do we have a crisis where it, then suddenly it, it, you talk about really doing what you've avoided for fifty years, right? Mm -hmm. But um, in the Latin America, the military simply didn't have the rent-seeking uh, roots that the Egyptian military. So we're talking about the Argentine, even the Chilean military, even the Brazilian military. Yeah, Brazil is a, a slightly interesting, as, as always said, euphemistically, slightly interesting exception. But there, the military, was, it was all about their, their governing structure as a military. So I, I'm trying to understand what, you know, what, what is really, what are we talking about when we talk about reform? Is it this, is it the same old, same old, which in which case there's going to be no, there's going to be no, no dramatic change that would actually change the way in which the economy is organized. Mm -hmm. Let's start from the IMF perspective. Uh, I guess, you know, when, when we speak about international financial institutions or international economic institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, we have to, at least in my point of view, we have to differentiate between the technicians who are working there and, and the politics of the entire organization. Mm -hmm which is mainly shaped or impacted by superpowers. Okay. So I'm sure that at the technical level, <laughs> IMF experts are sure, 100%, first of all, they are knowledgeable, so they know what's going on. <laughs> they know that, that, that even if Egypt is, is, is no longer giving subsidies, cutting the public spending, uh, you know, doing all the prescription or prescribed uh, um, uh, solutions, the problem is they know that very well, will always remain structural in the Egyptian economy because there is this very big part or of, of, the, of the economies taken over by the military. And by the way, it's very interesting also to speak of like, are we exaggerating when we speak to, of this military empire? Because Egypt is still big enough. Uh, President Sisi, for example, speaks of only 2% that the military uh, contribute to only 2% of the GDP. Uh, um, this is very controversial. I'm not sure if this, of course, like you can't you can't you can't say that this number is true by on official books, official records, but like you <laughs> still have so many other ways where it doesn't seem that the military is producing and they are producing, while, while, while it seems the military is not there and they are there. Uh, so again, back to the question uh, from the IMF perspective, I guess they have technicians who knows very well that there is a structural problem with Asia. But there is a real hesitation mm -hmm. to push hard, not because of the experts are hesitant, but because when it goes to the board, you know, it's mainly about United States. Right. And I guess even though every now and then we can hear some criticism from Biden administration, but they know very well that again, they shouldn't push too hard. I guess this is a key. Right. We should not push too hard. We should just, you know, save some time. I'm not sure if your question also applies to the Egyptian military and how they see reforms. Is that part of your question? Or? Well, I mean, I, you know, what the word reform means, is, but, you know, from each from these players. I mean, I agree with you. After '77 in Egypt, after the riots, I mean, the IMF backed off. I mean, it's all it's all about geostrategic interests. I mean, so uh, I think I think you basically answered the question, which is uh, there's kind of an equilibrium between so the, the the military, the United States, and the IMF about sort of what is tolerable. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of a plus a change sort of story. Um, it, it, you know, the logic of just squeaking, muddling, meddling through, muddling through in Egypt is remarkable. I mean, when you get to be an old man like me, you know, <laughs> you seem, you seem to, the story sounds very familiar, I have to say. <laughs> but but even if you if you didn't ask this question, I still want to ask. So no, no, I want to hear you. I'm just because, saying that yeah, in many sure. respects, address so much. But, but because yeah. this is a very important question. Sometimes we take things for granted. So what is report? Now, if we if we just move to what President Sisi genuinely believes, what reform is, I guess he knows very well that Egypt needs reforms. But the reform in his mind is much more of first of all, it's mainly economic reforms mm -hmm. because his his sure. empire is taken by the numbers. So he wants cash money. He wants to generate cash money as soon as possible and as much as possible. The problem in in my mind is it, a problem in my analysis is in his mind. The real model of reforms and of economic booming is Dubai. He's really <laughs> obsessed with Dubai. <laughs> and that's why it's not just, Kilian, it's not just about the, the administrative capital. The administrative capital, of course, is the biggest, you know, but, but they, as of now, Egypt has at least eight or nine different 
I don't know even, I don't want to call them satellite cities because they are not satellite cities. I don't want to call them gate communities because they are not just gated communities. Mm -hmm. I don't know, fantasies, yeah. kind of yeah, yeah. dream cities, fantasy cities, yeah. luxury cities. Yeah. And he goes like in every single governorate and then he, he makes like an enclave and small place. And this is like, you know, you have the best hotel in the world. You have the, I don't know, the tallest tile in the world. Mm -hmm. You have this luxury luxury life. You have the, I don't know, the biggest Ferris wheel in the world. <laughs> this is real. And, and then, and I guess in his mind, and again, I guess his general, in his mind, this is a way, first of all, you can get Egyptians, rich Egyptians, to spend their money in Egypt instead of leaving Egypt, going somewhere else. But this is also a nice way to get tourism. And this is a nice way to, to get investments. I guess this is how his mind functions. He, he thinks that dreams, say, I don't know, really, I need to find a, maybe let's call it fantasy cities, yeah. whatever. Uh, and, 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 and I guess this is his model of reform. Yeah. And this is what he thinks what Egypt needs. He doesn't believe that political reforms are really very important. Uh, imagine that in April last year, he was the one who initiated this idea of the political dialogue. Yes. For 12 months, I'm um, sorry, for 10 months, uh, from April last year to till now, mm. there is nothing. <laughs> You know, every now and then you hear something in the news about, okay, there is this uh, organizing committee and, and okay, this is a man who's uh, the head of the organizing committee. This man met with the other man who discussed, okay, what are the pillars? What are the sessions are going to, right. but, but you never you never have so far, you don't have a solid platform, mm -hmm. a solid reform where you can really say that, okay, this political dialogue is hopefully mm -hmm. can open some sort of a real, discussion a real conversation a real dialogue between the egyptian and the and the oppositions uh, it's uh, last week interestingly the president uh, i mean the regime allowed one of those who were in exile for years mm. uh, to 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 come back mm. and and actually they allowed a bunch of people but you never know what are the criteria so egyptian media would just describe them as great people they are very loyal to the country, to the nation, to the one, you know. The, but but you never know what are the criteria for others if they want to, to go back home and, and yeah. just feel safe. Mm -hmm. Th there are no guarantees. So again, the, the word reform is is very uh, is very controversial here because uh, it's all about perceptions, and his perception about reform is totally different from what we think what reform is yeah, about. Right. Yeah. Well, I have a mutual colleague here in Washington who's been going back. Okay. <laughs> part of the, it's, not, it's not secret anymore. So, Yes, please. Let's open it up. Uh, Stanley Clover, I'm an alum. Uh, you mentioned Sadat's assassination. That, to my mind, is critical. Extremists had penetrated the Egyptian military services. They were totally undetected. To pull that off. So I look around the Middle East, I, I see that more and more. Yeah. And we haven't discussed this, the political alignments within the Egyptian military. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about that. If you know, if we could have second round of the Arab Spring, could you see this sort of radicalization like we saw with Iran? More recently with the Taliban taking over Afghanistan. There is the Sadat precedent. Could that happen? Because the implications for the Middle East, if that were to happen, be extraordinary. Um, first of all, let's think if a second round of the Arab Spring possible. In my point of view, it's very possible because once you're not happy in your life, there is a chance, once you lose hope, there is always a chance that you go and explode and you don't really even think of like what's going to happen to your life or to you physically. Uh, I guess it's very possible that we can see a, a, another wave of the Arab Spring. I'm not talking about tomorrow, it can be in 10 years, 15 years, nobody knows. And if that happens, at least as far as Egypt is concerned, I guess that will definitely will not lead Egypt into any kind of democratic end because the younger generations who lived their 20s and early 30s during the revolution time in Egypt from the Muslim brothers and other jihadi and Salafi groups who are not loyal to the, to the government, they have seen 
how their organizations and their people have been liquidated, uh, um, tortured, imprisoned, etc. So I guess what they really believe and is is and we have some scientific research was done on like you know what what the Muslim process believe now and who those who live in Turkey and those and I guess they no longer believe in democracy. So what they what they think is should there be another chance to you know to uh, control politics? So we we should make it an Islamic revolution. And this has been mentioned in in many literatures that many of them believe that next step is an Islamic revolution. It's no longer a democratic revolution because we, we don't believe that democracy is real. We don't trust our civilian, secular partners in Egypt. Uh, in, my, in my point of view, this is very, very possible. Is it possible that, you know, that the biggest question is that the president can disappear from the scene because of a political assassination or jihadi assassination or whatever? Yes, it's always possible. You never know. You know, the, of course, he can't take all... The, you know, measures he needs to, to secure himself, but it's always possible. But I, in my point of view, the most important question is, does that really mean anything? Except maybe some people will be happy, except some people will feel okay. If Except that, of course, people will have high hopes for, for, for changes and transition into the, to democracy. But in my point of view, should that happen? Um, uh, in, in, in all means, we are not heading anytime soon into a real democratic end. It will be much more of political struggles uh, and a possible Islamic revolution in some countries. If not Egypt, it can be in Syria. If not Syria, it can be in, in Lebanon. Uh, so I'm not sure if I, I, I did answer your question. Did I? OK. Any other questions? Um, yes, please. My question is more about you discuss the relationship between Sisi and the Gulf countries. I would like to focus more on the relationship between the Gulf countries and the defense relation with them specifically. And you might not tell me, let's not generalize Gulf countries. Let's talk about Saudi specifically or the Emirates specifically. So I want to see how this relationship is tweaking and where it's going next and what's the past have still in relation. Like we know about donation for the military, but we don't know if they bought anything that Egyptian promise to give back because we're seeing in the media some talks about the money that the Gulf countries are asking back for. It, 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 is it in which form? Is it an offset in any way? Is it still money needed or services? And is it just for Sisi or the military? Like even if Sisi is gone, Egypt will also be asked for this. Will be asked for the money back? for the money, for the service, for keeping the relationship, because like I felt in your talks, you didn't insinuate about anything, but everything is possible. Like there's so many scenarios. We don't know what tomorrow will, will leave for CC one, and it's a one man leading a country, but the country will stay even after CC. So what's Egypt's Saudi relation in defense terms mainly? In defense? Yeah. Okay. Um, the defense card was actually played very well uh, by President Sisi in his first two couple of years of power, in power. And um, uh, there was uh, many talks about military cooperation with United Arab Emirates and with Saudi Arabia mainly. And um, that didn't go any far because first of all, because the Saudis and the Emirates got really involved and busy with the economic situation, economic reforms, etc. First and second, because I guess many people started to see that the Egyptian foreign policy is is much more working to stabilize the economic situation mainly, and that Egypt is just very keen to regain. Uh, 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 regional power, and uh, we we have not to forget that some leaks uh, uh, about President Sisi talking to his uh, chief of staff. I guess um, um, you know. Then he was mentioning the, the Gulf countries as a rice means they have just you know full of money, lots of money, but they, they have no brains. This is what it means in Arabic, uh, and uh, that's why, as of now, there is no defense relations, uh, or at least, of course, you can have some formal relations, but the defense part is not actually a very important 
uh, uh, a very important card or file for the of, for the Arab Gulf countries. First of all, because who is the enemy right now in the in the Arab Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates? It's not Israel. You know, Israel is no longer an enemy. Even if you don't have, of course, United Arab Emirates normalized relations with, with but even in Qatar, who didn't normalize relations, but it's not it's not about having relations as long as you know it's not at least a, a national security perception. It's Iran mainly. It's the Iran, the Irani uh, file. And now, if you want to secure yourself from any possible Iranian aggression or a possible revolution that can be exported to your country, to Saudi Arabia or to United Arab Emirates, you have mainly to rely on the West, mainly on the United States. Or, which is you can, as you can see in Saudi Arabia right now, you can also rely on Russia. You can rely on Turkey, but why should you rely on Egypt to participate in any kind of security equation to protect you. I guess in the Gulf, they don't perceive Egypt as an important card for the national security. Other than just speaking about let's keep Egypt stable, uh, let's hope that we will not see another revolution in Egypt that can really impact the public opinion in our countries or can really lead to any sudden uh, um, unwanted uh, uh, social or political changes in our country. But uh, what maybe I missed in your question is this money back? Is yeah. Um, do you think there is any liability left, like behind the tables, behind closed doors? First of all, I guess, and, and this you have a different source, but like my sources are all coming from the social media, speaking about, and I don't think that, first of all, they know that there is no money back, <laughs> realistically. <laughs> but, but away from that, yes, yeah, but, but. But maybe what they can do is not to ask their money back. What they can do, and I guess this is also a very big challenge for CC, is if they decide to stop investing in Egypt. So it's not going to be a money back. It's going to be we're no longer, it's not just that we're no longer going to help you. Because by the way, since 2017, they stopped this rice money that was coming. Uh, uh, and, and what they did instead was much more of, okay, let's, let's get involved in investments. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see, for example, how many hospitals have been sold to United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. how many uh, how many cement uh, companies have been sold mm -hmm. to Saudi Arabia, and now you have some sort of like partner or um, partnership between Saudi Arabia and many uh, and, and the military in terms of running uh, mineral, running mm -hmm. oil, running. But uh, so this is what they do right now. The biggest fear if if what would happen if they decide to stop investing in Egypt. So far, they do still invest in Egypt. Even though, if they there are some media noise here and there about that the Gulf got rid of want to get rid of CC or the Gulf is upset with CC or yes, they can be upset, but when they stop their investments, in my point of view, no, they are not going to stop their investments. But what they can do is they can do something like the IMF. They will try to pressure CC, not to change anything in the civil military equation, but to make much more of like transparent, uh, transparent. Uh, uh, policies where they can trust that their money is not going as donations and this money will come back with a, a real a real profit if not financial profit political profits and i guess this yes. is how the how the gulf is mainly thinking about egypt right now yeah. good question uh we have a few uh, questions in the zoom so let's turn to those and then Mahmoud, well, why don't we do one from zoom and then we'll get to you next uh, so the first from zoom how are outside powers like the u.s or other states and China affecting their relationship between the Egyptian military and civil state? How China and our <laughs> outside powers like the US, other Arab states and China affecting their relationship between Egyptian military and civil state? The, the regional and international factors are always important when we analyze civil military relations in any country, especially for example, Latin America was a very good example of that. Uh, still, uh, if there is any real change uh, again, I'm not speaking up about change in a positive way, but if there is any change to happen in the civil security, civil military, civil security equation of Egypt, it can really happen because of some pressures from the Gulf or from from United States. Uh, but that will get us to the back to the question: if if United States and uh, international institutions like IMF or World Bank or Arab Gulf countries are really keen to, you know, are really willing to 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 pressure. Uh, so I guess. The answer to this question, in theory, 
yes, they can really impact, but in practice, the implication is that the military is still in power because the military is still favored by all um, by all international actors, especially the West, the European Union, Arab Gulf countries. Now, China is a different story. China is, and, but I guess this is not just about Egypt. The Chinese model has nothing to do with security, has nothing to do with policy, has nothing to do with politics, I'm sorry. What they think about is just to, to, to generate some revenues, uh, to get some money. And that's why, by the way, China has slowed down much of their investments in Egypt because they know that what they are looking for to generate money is not actually happening the way they want. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I want to focus more on the civilian groups and the civilian personalities that the city has been approaching. Uh, will that attitude will expand with further economic uh, crisis just to cop more to like, to distribute the blame, for example, on what was happening in Egypt, and uh, to distribute the, the blame, the blame, yeah. yeah. And uh, how uh, how those civilian groups and personalities will react with further when they see that the, what what the CC is trying to do uh, and what is the relation that is going to happen is not bearing any fruits. Will they react? Uh, first of all, what do you think uh, CC trying to approach them? What about what do they think will be the end result of this, and how they will react when uh, what they have were hoping for is has failed? Will that go up on the CC, and why CC is trying to do this, which might go up in in his face in the future? For example, it might be a, a political risk for him to approach them. So uh, let's because this can be very tricky. What do you mean exactly by civilians? Because this is another point. I maybe failed to, to clarify in my talk. Who do we mean by civilians? Opposition groups, opposition personalities, that is. Okay, opposition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I guess when we are talking about oppositional groups in Egypt, we're talking about two different main categories those who are inside Egypt and those who are outside Egypt. You know, the outsiders those who can actually make it to Egypt or when they visit Egypt, they have to make it only a family visit, no political activism, etc. Those are trapped and they are not able to coordinate anything because they are they don't have a, a, a very well-defined political agenda. Um, they, they don't trust each other, mainly the, the Islamic component or the Islamic part and the, the civilian secular part. Uh, and so this is not now the big deal. The big deal is, is for oppositions who are oppositional groups who are in Egypt. Oppositional groups who are in Egypt uh, can be broken down into three different categories. Number one, um, those who are officially part of political parties, so political party activists or political party uh, figures. And those who are working mainly with NGOs, human rights, Etc., and some other independents who are not satisfied with what's going on um, used to play a very active role during January and what happened after January, but they are no longer there, even though if they are very uh, distressed or upset with what's going on. Let's take, to answer your question, let's take the reaction to uh, President Sisi's initiative to establish a political dialogue. Uh, the reaction was positive in general. And I have a justification for that. Uh, I cannot blame. Uh, I guess they are smart. They knew that maybe this political dialogue is not going really to lead into any real reforms, but for them, it was a chance. It was a room to negotiate. It was maybe to get some prisoners out, maybe to you know enhance uh, the, the civil society situation in Egypt, et cetera. So, First of all, I guess they realize very well that there is no real realistic political reform that is going to happen in Egypt. What they all do is that they, they are trying to improve their situation, to improve the terms of negotiations. But you can also see how they are upset and how they are, you know, shot because of the, for 10 months in a row, there is nothing happening. And every now and then someone comes and promise and, and doesn't happen. So I guess they, in general, they are not really, they are not really convinced that there is any real solid 
plan for a political reform. Uh, and also, they don't have any other alternatives but to wait for the regime to offer anything. And I'm not blaming them again because uh, you're you're dealing here with with policies of fear and, and intimidation, and and uh, which um, which there is no way you can really have an independent meeting of any political party without getting that green light from from security, even if it's a, if it's an official political party. Um, there is no way you can make any coalitions in elections, even if it's a formal elections, and even if you know very well that the electoral system has been, you know, engineered by the regime in a way to only to set, to to favor some people. But part of your question also, what the president expects? Yeah. Um, my approval be to be a political risk for him. What, I'm sorry, stay a little louder. And how it might be approved to be a political risk for him. A political risk for him. Or at least political risk. Uh, last week, in his uh, political speech, he was giving, a, delivering a speech, opening one of the mega projects. Uh, and then he said, officially, he said before uh, TV that you know, my relation with Egyptians, and usually he's, he's talking about himself and the Egyptians, you know, I guess this is part also of his perception. And, and my relation with Egyptians are, are always good and they trust me, but someone, or I guess somebody is trying to, uh, somebody is trying to um, explode or somebody is trying to make this relation bad over the last year. So his perception to, you know, the outcry or, you know, the upset or complaints of so many Egyptians for the economic situations over the last year. I guess he's also realizing that public criticism has increased to him and people are no longer very fearful. Like, I guess as of now, people can criticize him in the public transportations, not because they are not afraid, but again, they have nothing to lose. He perceives this as, as a conspiracy, as somebody is trying to uh, you know, to spoil the, the very good relations and the trust he built with Egyptians. I don't think that he sees any real risk coming. Of course, he is aware that if there is anything happens, you know, his life is going to be the price. He knows that very well. Uh, it's not that he's stupid or he doesn't understand, but I guess it's a, just much more of like, he believes that the Egyptians genuinely love him and trust him. Yes, they have bad conditions, bad economic conditions, but things will be better because they are patient, because they love their country. And anyone who's, you know, loudly speaking against the country or against the president is, is somebody who's trying to uh, just corrupt this relationship, this trust with the Egyptians. I guess this is how he sees uh, uh, what we, what we, Cold crisis, or what we call uh, distrust between the president and Sudan. <laughs> I follow up on that, Ahmed. What so I was curious, listening to your answer to Mahmoud's question, how, how do you interpret or make sense of the Tehran and Senafir crisis? You know, because that, if you think about the last sort of five, six years, I mean, that seems like the one moment where there was really kind of a rupture in in not a crisis. I mean, it's not. It wasn't. It didn't turn out to be that big a deal. But it was a moment where a lot of the political forces that were once in the opposition that then came to support CC, they sort of, you know, defected to some extent and, and, and you know, there were protests and there were denouncements in parliament and you started to see potentially the emergence of what could at some point be an, an opposition. Mm -hmm. And then of course, everyone fell back in line. And, and of course they were using a lot of the same nationalist tropes and discourses of the regime itself in, in, in their, mm -hmm in their uh, protests and whatnot. But I mean, is, is that sort of the, it, potentially a kind of a place to look for, 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 you know, where an opposition might take shape in Egypt? Is the islands that were- Yeah, yeah. These, and those, no, sorry, for, con Red sea for context, for those of you who don't know, there were these two islands in the Red Sea, Tiran and Senefir, which are uh, uh, totally uninhabited. Uh, basically, they're just two rocks in the sea and, and, and they were, gifted to Saudi Arabia, we're talking about the Gulf earlier, they were gifted to Saudi Arabia, essentially, and this sparked a big outcry, right, mm -hmm. among the, these domestic uh, political groups. So I'm curious how you make sense of that, Ahmed. First of all, he underestimated his reactions, mm -hmm. uh, as usual. So because, again, back to, it's the same idea of, like, Egyptians trust me, I know much better, God supports me, you know, just rely on me, everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. I know better, I see better. Um, 
Uh, and so I guess he underestimated the reactions. Mm. Uh, what I'm sure of is that he was actually offered with some sort of uh, uh, public intelligence reports about you know what can be the reaction from the public opinion. He either ignored it or he didn't really think something would happen. But then it was a real explosion. Yeah. And many people were starting even to speak up of another revolution because it looked like, you know, but, um, but you can also think of such kind of events you know, the uh, 2019 September uh, uprisings or whatever you call demonstrations or protests. Uh, you can speak of the Tirana and Sanofir, you know, uh, uh, protests. You can think them as some real challenges, some real tests to the regime and to how coherent the regime is. Mm. And the regime so far is very successful. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, because <laughs> the regime, is, and, and this is maybe part of his self-confidence. Yeah. He, he had passed already through some of the, <laughs> the problem is now how we interpret it. He interpreted it as a conspiracy. Oh. He, this is a, what he sees, it's yeah. conspiracy. We maybe I see it as a, a real, you know, uh, uh, frustration coming from the Egyptians. But the point is, regardless how we perceive it and how he perceived it, but he is self-confident because he knew that in in the two, actually three, because back in 2019, I guess 2020, mm -hmm. uh, no, 2019, December of 2019, we had also another very big and, and a series of protests for three, four days. Mm -hmm. in and again, he survived. Mm -hmm. And he survived because of, again, the security, because of the, the, how the coherent the regime is, because, because of media, because of regional and international support. And this is actually part of why he is, why he trusts himself, why he trusts the military, why he trusts the security, and why he's 100% sure that even if there is something, first of all, it's a conspiracy and we will defeat it because we survived before from many conspiracies. Uh, that try to mm. you know convince the people to take to streets and that we were able to mm. those tests are useful I suppose, for the regime. yeah and i guess this is yeah. how right. the regime yeah. use it it's it's a test they need yeah. a test it's like when when you're in the you know fire department and for for one year there is no fire so you have to go for some fire drills otherwise right <laughs> so <laughs> this is, yeah yeah good analogy yeah do we morph online yeah yes yeah, Oh wow, let's take oh, yeah, yeah. um should we do them in Paris maybe and then Ahmed can answer them in, in Paris. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's a great idea. That's okay, great. So we are here to uh, uh first thank you uh, for, for a very informative presentation. Could you look back and reflect a bit on civilian views of the military? The revolutionary suffocation of the people and the military as one hand struck many outsiders as overly trusting of military attentions at the time. Why did this idea have traction? Has there been much critical analysis of this moment among Egyptian academics or activists? Can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I fully understand it. Oh yeah, thank you, I'm sorry. Asking about this, you know, in Wahda, right? The sort of uh, notion of the civilians and military being one hand during the revolution. We can have this be the third question, it's the second one. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And then the second one, just for the sake of yeah, sure. the audience. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Again, everyone really enjoyed it. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank what you. do you think will bring about change in Egypt and especially regarding the relationship between civilians and the military in the next 10 years? If it is not an economic crisis or the replacement of LCC. Okay, yeah. Uh, I got it. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, this idea of the unity between the military and the people tells a lot. Uh, first of all, as I said in my presentation or talk that uh, one thing President Sadat started, but President Mubarak instituted or institutionalized uh, was the idea that the security forces became the main actor in the political scene instead of the military. So during Sadat and after him, Mubarak, the military started to get back. Again, they kept some positions in the cabinet, some positions in the local government, government uh, the, the retired senior officers, of course, got some sort of compensations in many ways, and they definitely, you know, left to play a very important role in the in the economic scene. But they were never perceived, at least by the general public, they were never perceived as a pro regime, as a corrupt organization, as an aggressive organization, as a bloody organization. Th th there was always a very good image about them, and that's why when. 
when in January 28, when the military started to deploy forces into Cairo streets and Alexandria, etc., they were, I guess, they were highly welcome. I know that now every now and then somebody would say, "Ah, I didn't welcome it," but I, I'm speaking about the general, the general public welcomed it because that was a real idea that the military is. An independent institution. It's not part of the regime. It's it's an independent. It's part of the state, not part of the regime. We trust we trust the military. As of now, you can see that this has changed a lot. First of all, because of Tehran and Sanofir, where the military is blamed by the general public, even if if the military was not the main uh, 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 side who signed the agreement, but still, uh, they are blamed for this. They are blamed for Rabah and you know the. Uh, uh, clashes <laughs> with uh, Muslim brothers, etc. They are claimed for now, uh, given the current economic situation. Uh, you know, many people have started to see the corruption side. Many people have started to think of the military, or at least the senior officials of the military, as not as no longer part of the state, but as part of the regime. Yeah. Which means that the military replaced the rule, the, the or the position, let's say of the security services during Mubarak and Sadat, which in my point of view, very dangerous. If, you, if you're really taking seriously this idea of, you know, Egypt should be stable. Yes, I wish Egypt to be stable, but it's stability of Egypt now is, is really, you know, under fire because like when the general public has this very, not just negative, but they, they, they genuinely believe that the military is part of the regime, not part of the state and that they are just playing as if they are an interest group, just generating money, raping money here and there. And, and uh, unfortunately, this there is no longer this one hand uh, <laughs> kind of between the, the state and-, and well, The military uh, manipulated that idea. Of course, yeah. definitely. In 2011 and 2013. Kabuki. Which- the Security forces are the bad guys, but were they? One hand. Which actually, this morning I was talking with Kalin about about how to how to define even the civilian military. You know, sometimes we think maybe in in who, who is civilian. Uh, it's very interesting to look back in 2013 and how many people, including those who were pro democracy, like I can't really claim that they were not. They were pro democracy, but then they were calling the military to civilize the. Church. This is exactly what was said in the streets of Asia. We are calling the military to protect us from the Muslim Brotherhood and to maintain the civic, civic, civil mm -hmm. nature yeah. of the state, yeah. which is very interesting. How come you're, you're calling them? Which means actually back then, again, the military was never perceived as part of the regime. The military was perceived as an independent organization. The Muslim Brothers were not perceived as civilians. They were perceived as Islamists, which for many Egyptians didn't, make them civilian. And now in order to protect the identity of Egypt, we need the military to step in. If you if you think about it from this perspective, it makes makes sense. Uh, but but again, it gets us back to now how the military is perceived by the by the general public. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the second question? Oh, what's going to lead to change? Oh yeah, if not the economic the next 10 years, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm always thinking like, you know, uh, in, in Brazil, my understanding is um, that change was brought by a rational decision from the military, not to withdraw, but like, you know, to take a side and push some <laughs> civilians to the <laughs> forefront. Uh, in Argentina, it was this decision and was definitely uh, uh, miscalculated. And in Chile, this is only this is a very interesting case because in Chile, this is the only dictator I know who went for elections and, and it was fair and free and, and he left power because of the Chilean people. I'm not sure if maybe some people have different reading to what happened. But anyways, so I, I guess if uh, if there is any again, if there is any change to happen in the seven military relations in Egypt, it will be due to political economic factors mainly. And it will be like because it's inevitable because the uh, United States and superpowers, uh, Arab Gulf countries will be willing, still willing to help the Egyptian regime, but they will no longer be able to do anything because on the ground, you know, things will be totally out of control. I don't see any voluntarily kind of or rational kind of decision from the military to, to step back or, or, or a real political reform agenda. Uh, this is something I cannot see in the foreseeable future. 
why don't we do this? Why don't we lift, why don't you read the remaining questions, Coco? Uh, since we only have five minutes, and then Ahmed will let you choose which ones yeah, you'd okay. like to answer because we only have five minutes left. Um, do you see transparency requirements as a result of IMF efforts and IMF stakeholders, US, as being a potentially successful mechanism for drawing external investment? And then uh, more about IMF. How can IMF stakeholder votes and the financial crisis in Egypt be used to force greater social protections for religious minorities, activists, advocates, et cetera, in Egypt? Has the regime, uh, regime shown an openness to compromise on political issues in exchange for economic protections through continued IMF loans? Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. So uh, again, the, the IMF, of course, is seeking transparency. This is part of what the IMF is, is part of the conditions. You have to be transparent. Uh, but again, back to the question of how to differentiate between experts and politicians within the IMF, how to differentiate between the technical part, which really sees the transparency issue as a priority. And they are ready. And I guess the only reason why the World Bank 2019 report and the IMF 2020 report came to officially refer to the Egyptian military, and even the IMF started to break down the activities of the Egyptian military, asking the, the Egyptian country to, as a state to uh, unify, uh, put them under one scheme and, and, and uh, ask them to be transparent, et cetera. The only reason is, is how technicians and experts within the IMF were really pressuring for some sort of political transparency. The question would be always, to what extent the pressure will remain or will continue? And, and, and again, as I said, I don't see any, any real pressure beyond one point, which is we advise you to do so and so, we hope you do so and so. Now, if Egypt kept the military intact from any kind of, of, of transparency, of course, what can happen is the IMF may take a decision to stop the, 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 the aid, but the point, or not the aid, actually, the loans. But the problem here is, again, this is not the decision of the board within the IMF. This is a decision of the big contributors to the IMF, and which I don't see this possible. Yeah. All right, well, let's wrap things up there. So we know to wrap up on. Um, but Ahmed, thank you so much. Your, your thoughts and comments and your presentation was so, it's so insightful. Line. We learned a ton. So please join me in thanking Ahmed for watching. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. And thank you everyone for joining yeah. online.